Awesome. Okay, so this is about surviving the teenage months with your dog. And um, another job that I have is I actually teach children. So I teach children in an extracurricular activity. And I've taught group classes of four, five year olds, six, seven year olds, eight, nine year olds, 12, 13 year olds. Um, and I teach class, I teach private classes for kids as well. So the dab was very popular. And that just always reminds me of kids. But anyway, um, I have, I've been teaching a private client and group, group puppy and adolescent classes for over 10 years. And yeah, I didn't want to just remind you that um, the information is the best that I have, but obviously it's not always perfect. So let's get started. Um, so today's goal, goal is to dive into adolescence. Um, I want to go over what to expect, ways to cope, ways to deal with your adolescent dog, um, and give you some specific games to play. Now, I don't think we'll have time to go through tons and tons. Um, I was actually just thinking I could even do a whole, a whole session just on um, pattern games, for example, but uh, I've just given you a few ideas and all the topics I'm going to talk about are easily, easily searchable on the internet and you can find them and learn more about them if they interest you. One second. All right, so what is adolescence? Um, without going too much into the science stuff of it, because that's not my specialty, um, we'll talk hormones. So think about how hormones are surging in their bodies. And unfortunately or fortunately, it overlaps a little bit with puppyhood. So you get this puppy into your home and it's a brand new baby species that has landed not only into a different species, home but into your home so your family's home that have your own sets of patterns and routines and everything so they're just learning all those things and all of a sudden they start to go into adolescence and now it feels like everything has been thrown out the window and it, it can be crazy um it's a, your transition to adulthood generally i've seen adolescence hit anywhere any as early as four months um, which definitely overlaps with puppyhood right um all the way to a, usually i would say adolescence definitely hits by about six months. Sometimes I would say it lasts two months. And unfortunately it could last up to your dog turning two years. Now I will say it seems to die down after about four months. Um, I think it coincides a lot with teething sometimes too, or teething might even start the adolescence. And then it's kind of like papers. And then I find that two years, there's a noticeable difference and your adolescence has transitioned into adulthood. So. Now, what to expect? Um, I find this is usually the most surprising for most pet parents and pet guardians is that, like I said before, you can start sometimes with teething. Um, all of a sudden your dog doesn't know any of the cues that it knew before. It might not know something that was super reliable like cum or like their name. All of a sudden they seem to not have any idea what you're talking about. Um, one is uncommon or new behavior. So I've had lots of puppies who never touched shoes, never touched things they weren't supposed to in their house. And all of a sudden they've chewed up three pairs of very expensive shoes um, one time when they were just being really quiet. So naughty behaviors are behaviors that you kind of just, you know, once your puppy is, is settled into your routine, you think, oh, I can just kind of let them have free reign of the house. And then all of a sudden those two quiet moments, you're like, uh oh puppy's up to something, I better go check. And then all of a sudden they're doing something they've never done before or something that's very destructive to you, um, which is really unfortunate. And you also might notice physical clumsiness, but I will say puppies generally don't have the greatest body awareness either. So I feel like that might just be a continuation of that as we're growing as well. Sometimes I've also noticed that some puppies become very different almost personality wise. So you might have a brave puppy that becomes more timid. Um, they're more easily fearful. They're quicker to bark or to lunge or to react to something that maybe they've seen a thousand times. I mean, that one red barrel on the side of a house um, all of a sudden is really scary to them one day, right? We do also have fear periods as puppies, but sometimes that maybe that one red barrel is scary every single time now that you've passed it after their four months. Old. You might just see a lot of fear, barking, lunging, it's stuff that, you know, is previously in their lives before it hasn't changed. And all of a sudden it's a very scary thing. So it, that, that can be part of adolescence. It could also be part of something else too. So, all right. Now, ways to cope. 
management. I'm going to go over some management strategies, providing some appropriate outlets for the things they might want to be doing, and mental exercise. And then we're going to go into the game, so specific games to, to kind of go back to the basics or to help you and your puppy kind of survive adolescence. Because really, I think it is about just trying to make sure you get through to the other end um, as intact as possible for everyone, because puppyhood is challenging and adolescence is even more. Okay. All right, so management. Um, my big thing is I would say don't rush freedom. I know it's sometimes really hard to imagine when I compare this to like zoo protocols. When the zoo brings in uh, a new silverback gorilla, for example, it takes months and months and months for that particular individual to be incorporated into the group. And there's lots of other factors, of course. However, I like to use that to help remind people to not rush their management system. And by that, I mean, if you have an X pen that keeps your dog in an area that, does, that keeps them away from the carpet, for example, um, sometimes at six months, we're like, oh, you know, puppy's been great. They've finally been potty trained. We can take the X pen away. And I would say to not, not to rush it, right? If you find, oh, we've had a couple of accidents, we can bring back that X pen or just keep it there. You'll, you'll have your whole lives with your puppy um, as they get older. So let's not rush these systems that are in place to help them make the best decisions possible. And that's what I like to think of management as. Management is a way to help you control their environment so they have the most opportunity to make the right choices according to the family and prevent the wrong choices according to your family from being made. A common one, like, like I was saying before, is potty training, right? They don't have access to your carpet. They can't pee on your carpet. Um, all right, so gates and barriers, x -tens. having a leash on in the house under supervision. Um, I always advocate under supervision because you don't want them to get caught on a garbage can and drag that across the house and then become really scared of garbage cans. So always with supervision. A leash is great because it can help them get used to a leash while they're puppies, and then it's also easier to catch them if you need to. Um, and then of course, as adolescents, because it's a little more unpredictable, I would really suggest that if you are going to big open spaces, use long lines for outdoors. So if you wanna practice your recalls or practice playing around in a big field, um, a long line, so a long leash that's 25, 20, you can get them all different lengths. Personally, I like 25-ish feet, um, is a good way to practice things a little more safely if you're worried or if they've been a little more into their adolescence. So my big takeaway from this is don't rush the freedom part of it. Okay. All right, so the other thing as I was talking about before, they usually have, puppies usually will go into a lot of things that we would say is like inappropriate or naughty behaviors. So a way to really help them and something that's, that I really advocate for is to make sure you fulfill the need, but in a more accept, acceptable manner, right? So if you find your puppy is digging or your adolescent is digging in the garden, um, that feeling of digging is actually very, couldn't be really reinforcing for your dog. So instead of preventing, A, I would, the management side of it, let's put some fencing around your beautiful garden to prevent them to get access to the garden. The next thing I would do is create some kind of appropriate digging space. So maybe that's a sandbox that you've loaded with some toys. You could bury a couple of treats in there if you want and encourage digging in that one location. Because if this one location they're allowed to dig in, so it feels good for them to dig in this one spot, but it also provides reinforcement. So they find their toy in there, they find their treats in there. Then you can really localize that digging. So they're not gonna look dig in your gardens instead they're going to go to their little sandbox and dig in there so that you know if your dog is digging that is kind of an example of how we can make sure it's an acceptable appropriate way because you control you know this is their sandbox for digging and then that way they're not shredding your beautiful flowers okay so another one is box shredding um if they're shredding like i have this picture of this cute little puppy who shredded the paper towel roll i mean paper towel roll is not it could be worse, of course. However, one great thing is we get packages delivered, right? Um, some dogs love to shred cardboard boxes. I actually have a dog that loves, loves, loves these seals. We actually put the little empty toilet roll um, in, on the garbage can that sits by the door. And he loves to come and he steals the little 
toilet paper roll and he goes and he shreds it to pieces and it brings him so much joy but he's shredding something we've kind of controlled or we've given him access to instead of grabbing the roll off of like the wall and shredding that instead so you can actually create little shredding boxes for your dog with the packages that we get come to the door you can save those boxes up and you can put um the crinkle the, the brown paper in there to help them to encourage them to tread you can even go as far as grabbing some treats and, and you know rolling it into the the paper putting it in the box and really encouraging that behavior within this one box and dogs are great at recognizing patterns at recognizing concepts so if you create this as a specific activity so you've gotten the box out you're going to put treats in the paper you roll the paper up you put all these paper things with treats in, in a box, you put it on the floor for them. They recognize a lot of these things, these pieces of context for them, and they put it together. Oh, I get to shred this box. And you're encouraging them. It will not necessarily lead to your dog going to find every single box in your house and shredding everything and all the content, right? There are some specific cues they're watching for, their treats are in there, and by adding those kinds of being consistent with your cues, even up to setting up this box to shred. Uh, we can really help them kind of, oh, I can, I want to shred this box, I can shred this box, but I shouldn't be touching those boxes, if that helps. And chewing, of course, is another one. So giving them appropriate things to chew on and also making it reinforcing. So bully sticks, even Kong, wobbles, things that are okay for them to chew on. And then you add some value to that, by either putting food in there or putting their kibble in there or adding something like even just if you if you can if you can handle peanut butter and your dog can handle peanut butter then you can even just take one slice of peanut butter and put it along the inside of a kong inside of a wobble and that could keep them busy for quite some time because they're trying to get every last little bit of it so and that can kind of locate your chewing to this one kong or wobble instead of chewing your shoes for example and then the management side of that look at that i just jumped the back to so, and then the, the management side of that is making sure that they don't have access to your shoes, access to those things. Will it be for forever? Probably not. But even with a puppy or an adolescent, I might put my shoes up on a table um, instead of leaving them on the floor until I can trust that my dog has come out of adolescence and it's a more responsible adult and not going to be chewing on my shoes, um, for example. Okay. I just realized like another way to flip my slides, which is great. All right, so one thing um, I like to do that kind of crosses over with puppies and with adolescents, I think it's more important even in adolescents, is mental exercise. So dogs come with a lot of energy. Puppies that are teething, moving into adolescence, tons and tons of energy. You can physically tire them out, of course. Um, but if you've had a puppy, you probably know that they will be, it will take you, you know, 45 minutes to tire them out physically. They'll take a 20 minute nap and then they're up and ready to go, and you are still exhausted. So I say that mental exercise is really a huge value tool for you guys. Um, I like to divide into four different categories, technically. I like to divide into sniff work, toys that move, toys that stuff, and puzzles. But we can go puzzles in a second. So toys that move. In the basic form, this is a ball that you, there's a hole in it. You put kibbles inside, and then they roll the ball, and kibbles will fall out at random. There's a few reasons I like I love this toy, especially for adolescents. A, those kibbles will come out at random every single time. It doesn't matter how often you stuff it or how many times you stuff it. You stuff that ball and it will either dump a few, maybe it'll dump one, maybe it'll roll around for a little while, dump some more. The other thing is it keeps your dog focused and attention on this toy. And it means that they are probably moving a little slower in your house than if they're zooming around the house. So now they're focused. It's kind of like giving a kid, you know, a coloring book. They're focused. They're in one spot. So the dog is moving around a little more gently in your house and they're getting their meal and they're very focused on this house. The next thing is toys to stuff. So like I was talking about before, this is your Kongs or wobbles, anything to stuff. And I'm giving you an example of a ball with a hole in it or the Kongs and wobbles, but it's a great time to be a pet owner right now because there are tons and tons and tons of options for things that you can stuff and toys that will move. I've seen squirrels, I've seen mushrooms, I've seen all kinds of shapes and different things, weighted things that will move around your house. Um, if you are sensitive to sound, 
and you have hard floors, I would say, you know, stay away from hard plastic toys that will move around um, and lean more towards like the rubbery type toys that move and dispense food. Now, things to sniff, we'll go into this a little more as well, but a snuffle mat, if you haven't, if you're not familiar with snuffle mat, it's basically a rubber mat that has fleece tied to it. It kind of emulates grass, um, just with lots of little fleece bits. And basically, you dump their food into the sniffle mat, and they use their nose to find eat all the pieces, and it takes them a little longer to eat. And if you haven't kind of gotten the idea already, a lot of these mental exercises are really just to lengthen meal time. So instead of eating their kibble in a bowl in about five seconds, um, you're elongating that time. So you're getting to move around, getting them to, to lick or sniff or chew. And now, so your goal with all of these toys, all these mental exercises, is to get them to sniff, lick, and chew. The reason for that is because these three behaviors will really help a dog relax and calm down. So the more relaxation you can promote, the calmer the dog, and also these things are a lot of mental exercise, so they'll be more tired. Um, you'll get more value from that than having to take your dog for a run all the time, right? Um, I also want to warn people that physical exercise is great, but just be careful about building an athlete. So I've had a client that once came to me with a dog that they were like, I can't handle it anymore. We take this dog out running eight hours a day. So the wife would take the dog running in the morning for four hours, they were both marathon runners, so they did a lot of running anyways. But And then the husband would take the dog out in the afternoon for four hours to run. And they were like, the dog is still now is coming back with like, it's still not tired after these eight hours. What do we do? Um, and I was like, that is a lot of running. That is a lot of physical exercise. And what happened is they just built that dog into a, an Olympic athlete, basically, right? The, the dog... Now, you know, half an hour isn't enough, then you push it to 45 minutes, then you push it to an hour, and then you keep pushing the amount of time that they're exercising physically to the point where it gets to eight hours. Now, that's the only time I've ever had a client come to me running with their dog for eight hours, which means a lot. However, um, it is possible, so just be careful. Mental exercise is a lot easier for you guys to set up, right? You dump the kibbles in the ball, you put it on the ground. You just are going to kind of supervise, right? You don't have a lot to do. So mental exercise is also great for times when you're tired. It's also great for times when the temperature outside is not appropriate, right? I don't know about you guys. We're going through a heat wave right now, but in the winter, we're in Canada. So it can get to like minus 40 Celsius. Well, that minus 40 doesn't matter either way. But minus 40 is very, very cold. You can't really take your dog out for very long or at all where you have to put many layers on and they have to be out for very, very little time. So same thing with heat waves. Uh, you want to be very careful with, with temperatures outside. So these are some great things to do as well during that time. Okay, so um, now that you have an adolescent, what do you do first? So the, this next bit is going to be about games to play. So these are some games that I thought would be very appropriate for an adolescent because um, we're going to go back to the basics. We're going to keep it simple and really reinforce some, what I'm assuming, things that most pet parents would like to have and have consistently. So attention to Gambler, for example, so recall game, and then follow the games, which would lead to loose leash walking. Um, I think for any pet guardian, a default behavior is really important and can be very useful to any family. So what a default behavior is, is a behavior that just happens, you practice it so often that it happens by default, right? So for example, um, a sit. So if in doubt, so if I'm in doubt, the dog says, if I'm in doubt of something, I'm gonna do this. If I really want that roast on the table, I should do this, like I should sit. It doesn't mean you have to give them the roast, but them choosing to sit, to get the roast is much more polite than them trying to climb onto the countertop and into the onto the very hot or dangerous oven, dove, etc. Um, the idea behind a default behavior is it's a stationary behavior like a sit or like a lie down. If you can practice it often, practice it out of context. So by that I mean if you were to practice a sit five times a day, five times one session. And then you go about your day and then say you're you're getting out of your computer chair and you're just going for a stretch. You grab, you know, you put five treats on the table and you ask for five sit, treat, five, sit, treat, sit, treat. Great. 
and then try and practice out of context. So by that, I mean, usually when we are training, it looks, there's a very specific pattern, right? It might be we train, say, every day after dinner. So after all the dishes have been put away, you go and you get your treat bag or you get your treats and maybe you get your clicker and you go to the living room and you are ready to train. Well, your dog has been counting down the minutes since you've been putting the dishes. They know, okay, next is training, next is training. Okay, now we're closer, we're closer. Oh, now it's training time. And they're very excited about it, which is great. I think it's great to have a training time. However, what I say practice out of context is practice your sit, maybe pause your, you know, after you finish dinner, before you do the dishes, stop, grab five treats, put on the counter, practice it five times, and then keep going, and then finish your dishes, etc. Out of context within the day of the time of day is what I mean. Um, because the more often you practice it, any behavior that's going to be reinforced is going to be repeated. So we're going to use this concept to create a default behavior, which means if your dog is in doubt but they want something, they're going to sit and be like, can I have the thing? And you get to decide whether or not they get the thing, like their squeaky toy or whatever it is. Maybe you put the squeaky toy on the table because it was annoying you and you forgot about it. And now they're sitting there staring at the toy and staring at you, staring at the toy, staring at you. And you go, oh, right, I forgot. Here you go. So that worked. It reinforces the behavior. I'm going to sit here and I'm going to get the thing that I wanted. But it doesn't mean you have to give it to them every single time, right? Like I said, with a, a roast on the on the table, it doesn't mean that you have to give them the roast. It just means they're telling you, I would like the roast. I'm going to sit, which is much more polite than jumping on your table. Okay, so another game that I think, I think every pet person should know, should know nose work. And so I've put in specific directions in this presentation for you that will get you started. And if you love it, please go find a nose work club. It's a great game to play. Um, it's a lovely, lovely sport too. There's lots of different associations with it. It's really become quite popular lately. But basically we're going to build, the first thing we want to do is build a context for this game, okay? I know I've been talking more about context and pattern. The things you're gonna need are boxes and treats. And I would say cardboard boxes are best. So those boxes you get delivered to your doorstep are fantastic for this, or just go and collect some boxes. Um, you're looking for boxes that are about Shoe box size, a little bit bigger, a little bit smaller. Um, I wouldn't go anything smaller than like baseball size box. I don't necessarily would go much bigger than, I don't know, um, maybe, I wouldn't go too big of a box just because you'd have to store it somewhere in your house, right? So the idea for this though, is I would love for everyone to be able to put their dog into another room. And that could just be, you put them behind a gate and you drape a towel over the gate. And then you're going to spread some boxes in your room, three boxes to start, for example. Now, all of this is to build context, right? The context of you're going to be put in another room separate from me. You can't see into the room. When, when they enter the room, they're going to see boxes on the floor. So all of that is part of the context of the scheme. While you are setting yourself up, so you've got some boxes on the floor, and then you want you to put some piles of food on the floor. So you can use their kibbles. Um, I might mix it with something really delicious, like their favorite treats or pieces of a hot dog. Something really smelly helps too. Um, and then you're just going to put three or five pieces of the of each in three or five piles. I would start with three piles, and you're going to make it very easy, right? You're going to put it almost like they're going to walk into the room and just trip upon these piles of treats, because right now you're just trying to teach them the pattern of this game, and you want to make it very easy with. You want to build it so that they're like, yes, I'm super excited to get into this room and find these treats. So they walk into the room and you sit, then give them a cue, right? You open the gate, go sniff, find it, whatever it is you want to, whatever words you'd like to use. And then they should just walk into the room and be like, oh, there's boxes. Oh my gosh, treat here, treat here, treat here. They eat them all up. Fantastic. Do you like two or three rounds of that where it's going to be super, super easy. Once you start to see excitement or, oh my gosh, it's that game. I get fun. I'm going to run over to the gate because it's very exciting. Then you're going to want to start making it a little bit more difficult. But I want to see the enthusiasm first before you start to make it more difficult. Because if you make it too difficult too quickly, then it's not worth it to them. And they go, oh, well, 
I'm good. I'm going to go do something else instead, actually. Okay. So once you've got enthusiasm for the game, once they're excited about it, now we can start to make it a little bit harder. And there are entire courses on nose work that I happily encourage you to go and find. Um, but the basics of it are things to remember is that you're going to move these little piles of treats closer to the edges of furniture or rooms or surfaces. So furniture, chair legs, um, corners of rooms, etc. Now, I would be careful and avoid putting them near your air vents or windows um, or in front of or near a fan, for example. Just where air is going to move a lot because they're using their nose, right, to find each of these treat, piles of treats. And I would still say use like little piles of treats or food just because you want to make it really reinforcing, really rewarding for them to find this. They've discovered it, they found it, and it's reinforcing them right away. You can change the orientation of boxes, right? It doesn't have to be a complicated thing to change in the room every single time you do it, but you can just move the boxes around. You can start putting little piles of trees inside the boxes or next to the boxes. Um, for elevation, I would do, I would play this game quite a bit before you start putting things above ground and you never want to go, especially the beginning, advanced stuff is a little bit different, but the beginning, don't go any higher than your dog's shoulder because that becomes very different. It's a very different thing above their nose height. So always go nose height or lower. Okay, so these are just some basic, basic rules. Um, I would really look, look into it if you like. And the thing you can think about is think about fluid dynamics. I know that seems very strange to introduce in dog training thing. However, there are lots, think about how dogs see scent. Um, dogs interpret scent with their nose, but we can't see it. But they almost see it with their nose because they can detect different volumes of scent. So now you have to kind of think about fluid dynamics as far as how that scent is moving in your room, depending on the windows and the fans and just how air moves in your, in your house to begin with. Um, so if you want to get really complicated, it can get super complicated um, quite quickly, but easier is kind of better for the beginning of the game for sure and you want to really build that enthusiasm before you start changing the rules and make it too difficult okay um you don't want to find yourself having to help your dog a lot the great thing about Norsebook games is that it's not a lot of effort from us right we toss some boxes out we hide some treats we just let them do their thing you release them they're hunting for it what's great is you can hear their nose sniffing you might watch their ears moving. You might watch their head and their bodies move. All kinds of fun things to learn about your dog as they are playing this game. And um, lots of opportunities too for you guys to kind of just sit back and watch and observe your dog's behavior, which is also fun and great. Get to know them more. But yeah, so nose work games are fantastic. If you definitely do the basics and if you it interests you and you definitely want to play more, there are great, great, great classes and associations and competitions and stuff to kind of keep going with. Okay, I know I've talked a lot about nose work, so let's move on to another game. So this is the attention game. So if you, I like to think of it as like, if you're adolescent, you've probably done a lot of this with puppies, right? But when your adolescent becomes an adolescent, a lot of things go out the window. So these are the, some of the things that I think you could always practice. You can always practice and you can get something out of it. And it's always great to kind of go back to these things. So you're going to watch their head. As soon as their face turns in your direction, and you're not necessarily looking for eye contact at the beginning, you're looking for just for their face to turn in your direction. You're going to mark or click, and then you're going to throw a treat in front of your toes. In front of your toes specifically, because it's setting you up for success and it's setting your dog up for success. They're going to eat the treat probably and look right up because they're right there. If you were to toss the treat across the room, that makes it a little more challenging, right? If you toss it across the room, they now have to go across the room and get it. And then, wow, look at all this stuff over here. There's that, you know, old kibble that I forgot about underneath the couch. Oh, there's my toy. And all of a sudden, there's all these other things that are very distracting. It could be distracting to your dog that you're now, it's harder to get their attention to come back to you. So I say start with between your toes. And then as you gain more experience, if that one day they're being fantastic, then start tossing it to the right, to the left, across the room, behind you. You have lots and lots of options. 
then you can go to a different room, right? So I've got some of the variations written down for you here, some ideas for you to throw a further away to the right, to the left behind you. I've got a further away there twice. Treat directly to your mouth. If it is, so if you are outside and you're just trying to practice the attention game and you're getting nothing, put the treat directly in their mouth. So they look at you, you can click or mark or however you'd like to do that and then just bring it right to their mouth so they don't have to look for it, right? If you're outside, it can be very distracting to put a treat on the floor because now they're, you know, oh my gosh, look at this grass. There was, there's some rabbit poop over here. There's some, you know, smells of another dog over there. Maybe there's all kinds of things in that grass. So sometimes grass can be more distracting than like your, your kitchen floor, your living room floor, for example. Okay, so that's the attention game. And like I said, once you do that, and you can do all those variations in one room, you can take it to another room. Um, one of the one of my favorite places to train is the bathroom because we never take our dogs into the bathroom except for bath time. So training in the bathroom, A, it can be a little tight for space for sure, but it's kind of a new experience for most dogs. So once you've mastered a certain game, like the attention game in like your living room, take it on the road, try different rooms. And once you've done all the rooms in your house, go to your backyard, go to the front, go to, you know, different places. The more places you can take them to do these kinds of games, um, it adds a whole new dimension to that game. And it also adds more of their process for it, right? If they can pay attention to you in all these different places, it'll probably get easier and easier. All right, another game. So this is one where I'm not going to talk a ton about it because I, I think I could do a whole presentation about it. One of the sets of letters next to my name is CCUI, which is a Control Unleashed Certified Instructor. I might have mixed, mixed up those, those words in a row. However, these are the names of some of the games that I think are perfect for adolescents. There's a look at that game, the one, two, three game, Super Bowls and up, and up and down. And right now, I think actually this weekend, is the Control Unleashed conference that's happening. And you can, it's online as well, as well as in person, but um, yeah. So Control Unleashed has, these are the books that they have. You can, you don't have to buy up all three. You can just have one. And I think Reactive to Relax is the newest one. Uh, you might have to check that as far as publishing date goes. Um, they will have all the games in there each book has each game, has all the games. They're just a little bit more specific depending on which book you have. Um, these are great games to play with your dog. They are patterns that are easy for a human to remember and easy for a dog to pick up. So they're quick to start playing. It doesn't take tons of setup. It doesn't take tons of learning beforehand. There's not tons of skills. You have to teach your dog before you can play them. Um, and they also, like Super Bowls, for example, uses bowls, but you could use anything, right? Plate, trivet, um, bowls, you could use frisbee, uh, all kinds of things. I, th I think I've even seen people use soccer dots, like those pylons, the flat pylons for soccer, as a Super Bowl as well. So, um, but feel free to look them up. Um, if you want, I know that Leslie McDevitt, who is the person who created these games, who wrote these books, has... Besides the books, she also has a YouTube channel where you can see these games taught um, directly by her, as well as there are plenty and plenty of people, um, plenty, plenty of videos online to watch how to do these games and, and different versions of it. Okay. All right. So one of the last sets of games that I really encourage you to do is follow me games, right? So if we think of the what I'm assuming most pet parents want is recall, so dog that comes when you call, dog that walks on leash, um, and a dog that, you know, likes interacting with you. So follow me games um, would be, you know, recall. So instead of chasing your dog, and I, I actually encourage you to really consider and think hard about whether you should, you want to be chasing your dog, even if it's just for fun, because you're kind of encouraging this game of, of keep away um, which could bite you in the butt later on, right? Um, instead, I would, you know, run away from your dog. And when your dog catches up to you, that's when you can have your, your fun reinforcing moments of like, hey, we're going to roughhouse a little bit and maybe give them a treat when they catch you. Um, and then it becomes, you have to throw a treat away so they go eat the treat. So you have time to run away. And, and that really actually encourages a lot of following me. 
you throw the treat, you move, and then you could also, you know, just kind of wander around your backyard or wander around with the, on in a field um, with your dog on a long line and without even looking at your dog. Anytime your dog is kind of nearby, use your periphery, give them a treat right to their mouth and then kind of keep walking around. So what's happening in that situation is your dog is just being reinforced or rewarded for being near you, which is really, A, it's going to help your following your recall. It's also going to help your loose leash walking too. So just reinforce or reward any time they approach you, right? And you can get as creative with that as possible if you like. Um, all right. So another game, very similar to the attention game, is name attention. And really the only difference is that you're using their name, right? So you throw a free treat on the floor, you call their name, they're, they turn their face in your direction, you mark or you click, and you throw the treat in front of your toes. Same variations from the attention game also apply to this one. The only difference is their name. And I do like to pull your attention, actually, to the difference between these two games. You've got attention and you've got name attention. In attention, you are re reinforcing them for having chosen to look at you of their own free will, right? They happen to look at you, click treat. Awesome, right? In the name attention, you're asking for their attention and then they're giving it to you and you're reinforcing that, which is fantastic too. They're both very important games. However, I like to point out that they're two very different behaviors. In one, you're asking for their attention, their name, and the other, they're just happening to give it to you and then you, re you reinforce that. So that really creates a dog that's going to check in with you often. And that's a really good thing as they're going through adolescence, because if they're unsure about something, you want them to check in with you and not decide to do something on their own. You want them to be like, mom, can you see the scary thing? Yeah, thank you. I saw that. Let's go for a little over here. Let's go do something about that together. Instead of them being like, scary thing, and then they choose to do something about that scary thing themselves. Anyway, we'll keep moving. All right, so a little bit going into follow me games for recall and name games. So name attention, obviously. And then using a long leash at a park, so 25 to 30 feet, playing hide and seek, hide and seek in your house with multiple family members or friends um, is great too. So everyone hides with you know a handful of food and then you take friends calling your dog back and forth and then they get reinforced for coming and finding the person and that can be a fun game um, with the family. Now, the really important thing I like to point out with recall is that we need to be careful to not muddy the water. So what I mean by that is that we want to be thoughtful about when we use a recall. So if you say, my favorite example is, say you're just moving from room to room, doing your laundry, et cetera, and you're just going from one room across the hall to the other room, and you're just like, oh, hey, Fido, let's come over here with me. And then you move into that room and you're doing the laundry. If you said, Fido, come, your dog was like, oh, that was my recall. And they go over with you and then they go, well, where's my, wh where's the reinforcement for that? So right there, you're devaluing your recall just a little bit, right? So my other big key to this is to reinforce every recall. So your current recall depends upon your history of recall. The dog that is able to recall away from a deer or from a rabbit or from something in the wild is usually a dog that has been reinforced every single time with like the best thing. You never want to make it a bad thing for your dog to come and approach you. The other thing is you want to make it a great thing every single time they come and approach you. So be thoughtful about when you use the word. If you're just moving from room to room and it doesn't really matter if your dog follows you or not, then just use something else. Like, hey, Fido, I'm going over here. If they choose to follow you, great. If not, and it's not a big deal, awesome. If you want it to be a recall, Fido, come, then make sure you're going to pay for that recall. Okay. All right. So in summary, adolescence is difficult. I understand. It's, it's, it's not easy. However, your sweet dog will come back. I promise you. One day you'll be like, oh my gosh, all those cues they forgot, totally back, fantastic, right? Um, be consistent as you can. I know that gets harder the more family members you have in the household, but be as consistent as you can um, throughout their adolescence. So even though it feels like they haven't heard that word ever before, uh, you might have to go back and kind of remind them, do a little mini training session, and then bring it back into your toolkit. Use your management tools. And if you can, the thing I really like to impress upon people is try and really work with the being that is in front of you. So if they are having a bad day that day, 
Maybe we're not gonna add another progression on that very fancy trick you're learning. Maybe we're just gonna work with some attention, some very easy for them things to do to boost their confidence, to get them an easy win. And also maybe they're just having a bad day. The squirrels are running around like crazy in the backyard and it's been very tiring for them to watch out the window. So they're exhausted already. So maybe they're just not up for it today, right? So with adolescents and all the things that go on in their bodies, please, you know, always think about working with what you have in that moment instead of trying to progress on the plan that you probably made in your head. So yeah, and with that, I hand it back. Any questions, Miranda? Yay. If anybody has questions, please put them into the chat for me. Um, somebody asked, does the timing of spay neuter affect the severity or duration of adolescence? I believe there are lots of wonderful scientific studies um, that will address that. Um, I can only speak upon the experience that I've had and the um, In the, I don't know if I've even seen hundreds of dogs, but I don't even know if I, maybe dozens, let's say dozens of dogs. Um, yeah, I think I'll leave it at that. I think I will leave it to you. There are many, many research things you should be talking to your vet about because I, I hesitate to cross into territory that's not mine um, because I also get annoyed when other professionals cross into our territory too, so. Yeah, yeah so, so a couple of things about that question. One of them is that, again, adolescents were we're kind of using different definitions, right? So some people were talking about until they hit that sort of social maturity or, or sort of that um, developmental maturity, which for some dogs could be at two or three. Um, sometimes we're really looking at like that six month to year old dog. So depending on what we're looking at, um, the spay and neuter is not going to necessarily impact that so much, but when you get your dog spayed or neutered and whether there are behavioral implications of that, there's a lot of research on this topic. A lot of it is conflicting. Um, so there are a lot of potential reasons to wait or not wait. And again, just like Camila said, that's, that's where I would consult your vet. Um, but the research is ever changing, but it's not going to, it's not going to change the timing of your adolescence. If that makes sense. All dogs go through adolescence. How about that? Yeah. Yeah, of all exactly. Kinds. Yep. And they're, again, the studies are all over the place. So there are some of them that would indicate like better might be faster, might be better or not doing it or yes, doing it. There are a lot of different potential ramifications. So it's tough. It's a lot to think about for sure. It's a very so many things to think about. Yeah. Um, yeah. Awesome. I think that is, I will give folks one more minute in case they have questions A reminder that this will be on YouTube, hopefully tomorrow if I get it up. Um, thank you to everyone who donated to make this webinar possible. Again, we are a 501c3 nonprofit and Camilla is part of our BIPOC speaker series. So all of our BIPOC speakers are paid for their time, which is really exciting. So your donations go to a great cause and to helping bring lots of free resources to folks who need it. Um, so thank you everyone for being out here today. And Camilla, thank you so much for joining us all the way from Canada. Um, we really appreciate it. Your weather is probably better there than it is here right now. So uh, yeah, here. yeah. So enjoy, enjoy a like a little bit of a shiver tonight if you have an opportunity yeah. to do so. We won't have those here for a while. So um, thanks everyone for joining us, and we'll see you next time. Bye.